we can transition, maybe not entirely seamlessly, from what Kierkegaard says to something that Chogam Trungpa says. So Kierkegaard says that if we were to experience anxiety correctly, in inverted commas, that would save us from perdition. So the implication is that there is a way to experience anxiety that turns anxiety from a curse to a blessing, essentially. Which isn't going to sound very plausible to anyone who suffers from anxiety, I'm sure. Kit God when he says this, he doesn't mean, I presume he doesn't mean, I'm sure he doesn't mean that there is a right way to work with anxiety, as in, as in following the correct rules, doing the right things, A, B, C. Obviously, there isn't a right way or correct way in that sense. For reasons that we will see shortly, and um, that couldn't possibly be the case that there could be a right way to work with anxiety or a method not to an be anxious, a method not to worry about things. That is an absolutely um, crazy idea that there could be such a thing, Al although it has, it, it, the idea comes naturally to us because we are um, very logical in the way of in the way that we look at things. And logic never sees the full picture because as Adam Watts says, as everyone, <laughs> anyone who talks about thought says, it fragments everything, it breaks everything up. It doesn't show the whole, it shows a part. It shows a fraction or a fragment of the whole as that whole, as that fraction or fragment would look if it were the whole, which it isn't. And so whatever it looks like, according to the way we see it, isn't anything. It's a mind-created hallucination, albeit a very familiar mind-created hallucination that we don't understand to be a hallucination. So we just have to be careful of this, um, the way Kierkegaard puts that. He's not prescribing a particular way. So then coming, coming on to Chagyan Trungpa, speaking of meditation, Chagyan Trungpa says that we normally only have two ways of dealing with stuff, mental stuff, stuff going on, feelings, thoughts, stuff that's going on with us. One is to repress it and one is to act it out. Now, it needn't have been John Yam Trungpa who said this, any psychotherapist would say the same thing. But it becomes clear when we're talking about meditation. It becomes a lot clearer when we're talking about meditation. So we all know what repression is. Something comes along and I force it down, I push it down, I silence it, I quieten it. That's one way to deal with stuff. The other way is to translate that pain into action and project it outwards by some kind of activity or some kind of behavior, thereby making it everyone else's problem, not mine. So even though when we see someone who's kind of acting out, throwing a wobbly, throwing a tantrum, whatever, the impression is they're in a lot of pain. That's not really it, because they're in the process, they are in pain, but they're in the process of acting it out, i.e. throwing it out there into the world. And when we're doing that, when we're acting out, when we're translating emotional pain into a behaviour, we don't feel the pain, really 
obviously. Yeah, we'd say that we're suffering, but we don't really feel the pain. If we did, we wouldn't bother with the behaviour, we wouldn't bother acting acting it out because there'd be no point. The only reason we, we're so keen to act it out and straight away the pain comes, the acting out starts. The only reason we do that is because it um, stops us having to feel the pain. What other motivation do we have? That is the motivation for all mechanical life. So if I repress the emotional pain, I don't feel it, so that's good. That's the motivation for repression. We all know that. No one's going to argue with that. And when we act out, the motivation is the same. So it's two ways of not dealing. So I can't remember, but I might have started off by saying these are two ways of dealing with stuff that's going on with us, thoughts and feelings that are difficult. It's a way of dealing that is not dealing. Dealing is something different again. But it's the, we only know those two um, settings. It's like a, a, a kind of switch with two things, on or off. We can switch it the one way or think, oh, I'll switch it the other way. Not to imply that it's that easy to switch from one dominant modality, to switch from um, being a repressor to being an actor outer. It isn't easy, but those are the only two things. There's nothing in between. So what Chogun Trungpa says is there is something in between, something we just didn't think of, and we won't ever think of because it's not something you can think of, because thinking it operates in categories. It's yes, no, will I, won't I? Is the cat on the mat or is the cat not on the mat? It's the law of the excluded middle, which um, Aristotle pointed out thousands of years ago. So that's how logic works. Just like Aristotle says. Give the man credit for that, he was right. Rationality works by excluding the middle. It's only the one way or the other. Are you with us or are you against us? But that's a trap. It's a stupid trap. Because that's automatically putting yourself in the position of centrality where you absolutely have to be either with whatever the um, thing is or against it, whatever the cause is. That's a third alternative. That it doesn't matter in the least, and I know well that it doesn't matter in the least, and I don't care enough to either be with you or against you. That's the third alternative. That sounds a bit suspicious, because it sounds like ignoring. I'm ignoring the problem. But I'm not ignoring the problem, because it's not a problem. If some fella comes up and says, you're either with me or against me, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the pro problem, that kind of bullshit, that's only a cheap trick. He's got the problem, no one else has, and he's kind of trying to make it your problem by getting you to kind of like get some kind of ownership of it. There is that, that so in between acting out and repressing, there is something else. And that is not to avoid the pain of it, shall we say. To, it's like someone goes to slap you and you don't resist, you don't turn away. Kind of like um, what Jesus says, offering other chink. You don't avoid and you don't attack them first. You might think, I know he's going to slap me, so I'll punch him on, I'll put him off. Or you might think, okay, I'll run away. Neither of those. Whatever happens, we feel what's happening. So if the, if we remember that the only reason we repress, the only reason we act out is to avoid the pain, which forces us into one of those two camps, we can see that when there is no longer this overriding agenda to avoid the pain, I don't have to do either. So it's not going back to the example that I was giving or the illustration of um, either you're part of the problem or part of the It's not that we say that the pain is irrelevant, but that the question of avoiding it or repressing it or giving it to someone else is irrelevant. We don't even think of that. That isn't So as long as you're not thinking in terms of avoiding the pain, avoidance and and, and acting out, repression and acting out doesn't even come into the picture. 
what this comes down to is this is, is a kind of discovery that there is space within us so thinking about this in terms of space which is a really good way to think about it we can say that our normal rational mode of existence is like where these two steel plates and there's no space between them. Tiny, tiny space. So when he upsets at all, there's no space for it. What will we do? I know we'll repress it. Or I know we'll let it out. We'll give it to someone else instead. We'll throw it out there, make it the world's problem. But we, if we increase the space, we don't have to do that because in that space, there is the space for the emotional pain, whatever it is to be there. This is not, this isn't um, a complicated thing to understand, or it doesn't involve any fancy, um, fancy scientific terminology. It just means the space is there. It can be there. The feelings can be there. The feelings that I'm having can be there. They can be there because I'm not straight away clamping down on them, saying, I can't, this is painful. And clicking into that automatic pain avoidance mechanism which rules our lives. This might also sound very obvious. Well, of course we feel it, people say that. Yeah, feel the pain, feel the pain. But that's total crap because we can't feel the pain as something we should do because we work out intellectually. I know, let's feel the pain because that's just another manoeuvre of thought. The only reason thought ever does anything to, is to avoid pain. So this is a this is a cheat. Thought is only uh, half-heartedly, not even half-heartedly. It's totally insincere. It's saying I'll feel the pain. Really, it just wants to get rid of the pain. So we can't rely on anything the thought says. Thought can't help us in feeling the pain. So when the thinking mind gives the instruction, feel the pain. That's the thing to do. That, that's a joke. For one, we should never listen to anything that the thinking mind tells us about emotional pain because it's not, he it doesn't know. It, it, all it can do is manoeuvre, manipulate. It's like, it's, like a, it's like a ping pong player. It will bat it away one way or another. It can't accept. It can't allow. One thing, thought is all about controlling. It's all about forcing. Thought can never allow. Or if it does allow, it'll do so provisionally with an agenda. It can't do unconditional allowing. Because thought is itself a condition. So obviously it can't do that. So although this might be, it is something we're familiar with, talking about um, feeling the pain. That's very, very confusing and deceptive. It's much better to say, to allow the whatever it is to be there, to have the space to allow it to be there. There's no, I'm going to feel the pain. That's something I have to do because it's part of the thing that I need to do because of some reason or other. It's nothing like that. It's there. Just let it be there because it is there. We're not interfering. We're not doing it for a reason. If something's there, it's there. Just, it's there. So we're, we're unafraid enough or big enough so let it be there. We're not doing anything. We're not achieving anything. We're not, um, this isn't a method. It's not a, a form of interference. It's non-interference. So non-interference non is very, very, very simple and very, 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 very difficult at the same time because we're such compulsive interferers. Even if we, well, I suppose I was to study Taoism and I, get to understand interference always cause more causes more problems than it's supposed to cure because I never understand what's going on anyway so I'm quick to rush in but I haven't got a clue what's going on really so I'm bound to make it worse even if I were understand to understand that all that would happen is that I would see myself interfering my thinking mind would say interfering not good and then I try to interfere with my interfering the thinking mind just is no good at all. It doesn't matter what it sees. And it can see a lot, but then it does everything for the purpose of some gain because it's like the insight is turned into some kind of structure or system or behavior that we imagine can produce gain. So mindfulness in the Western world 
some kind of a thing. Yeah, it's definitely some kind of a thing. We can institutionalize it. We can make it into an official thing in order to obtain some sort of gain. So that's the key, that the thinking mind is behind that. Wherever you hear this talk of gain or profit or whatever, that's the thinking mind. It's always got its agenda. So what Jogran Tripa is saying is that all that is required is not interference, is whatever is there, just to notice that it's there, to be aware of it that it's there, which comes naturally. It comes naturally to be aware of stuff being there that is there because that's what awareness is. It's, it all happens, that just happens spontaneously. There's no doing, there's no method to it. If I'm aware of what's there, then this involves feeling the pain. Being aware doesn't always involve pain. You can be aware of um, happy things as well. But it, awareness is equally prepared to, to, to feel pain as to feel anything else. It's not got no agenda, unlike thought. You could say that, well, consciousness has an agenda. It has an agenda to be aware of stuff. But that's not really how it works. It doesn't have to have, to have an agenda. That's just what it is. It, it doesn't have to have any agenda. If it had an agenda, then it would be doing whatever it's doing for a reason, and there is no reason. Reasons are all petty, futile, finickety, finicky little things. Oh, I'm doing this because of that. What's that? Then something else, oh, I'm doing this. All these that's, they don't exist in the real world. They're just little me mental tokens. They're just little, little mental promises of something good that's going to happen if we believe in the thinking process. And if we do what the thinking process says. So it's really interesting that in in, in our Western approach to mental health or um, mental distress, we only have the two settings. So we think we're smart and in a narrow way. Sure, we are very smart in a very, very narrow way, but we're not wise because we've only got the two settings. The one setting is act it out. So we all say, oh no, not that, that's not good. Acting out's not good. You know, that's what we want to try and stop. But then we do the other thing, because we've only got the two settings. We try and quieten. We try and um, soothe. We try to calm it down, quieten it down. In other words, we go for the repression instead. The thinking mind can only do those two things. It can only facilitate those two things. And weirdly, in the West, and I'm saying the West, it doesn't have to be the West, because it's only where that, that particular cult, rational culture is spread to. Could be, um, could be anywhere. But in this Western modality, a rational modality of thinking, a whole approach comes down to repressing. And as much as we love calming the feelings down, do some calming stuff, whatever, say the affirmations or do the self-soothing, whatever it is, that's all, all repression. Which ain't, as we know, ain't good. repression is never good news. It's going to come up again in double the dose, triple the dose. It's going to come up again with knobs on, with, with some friends, you know. It's going to come back again worse than ever. Which is so obvious, we hardly need saying it, but what isn't so obvious is the fact that this is what we are doing. We're, we're actually coming down to repression only in a scientific way. We're going to have a method to it and it's going to be evidence-based. Evidence-based repression, evidence-based denial and all that kind of stuff. And the reason we don't see the third alternative, which is just allowing the space to be there for, for this feeling to be in, to exist in, and which would involve not interventions, not interference, not, not procedures. It would involve the people around us not telling us what to do. It would involve, involve the people around us supporting us to be in that pain. Now, supporting doesn't mean telling we have to or it's going to be good. It's a wordless thing. It's not 
It's not that we have an agenda. It's just being present with it, witnessing it. Not in a cold way, but witnessing it in a benign way. As um, my therapist used to say, when I used to go and see a psychotherapist lady, she used to say that we are the benign witness. She didn't say we're the benign interferer. And she didn't say we are the repressor either. That's for the lads in the white coats. Or that's for the lads with a professional or whatever attitude. There's nothing professional about this. It's being human. Being present with someone who's in pain is being human. Professionals aren't necessarily any better than that, anyone else. What determines whether we're good at that or not is how much we ourselves have grown as a person. Not anything to do with anything else. And obviously, how much we grow as a person has nothing to do with what profession we might have. So it's a human thing we're talking about. And so the culture will be very, very different. In this case, we allow the space for whatever it is to be there. And then we see what happens. Not, not that we're counting off the minutes or looking at the clock, but we're just going along with it. See what happens next. Accepting what's happening because it's happening and seeing what happens next. Now, when we do that, the energy of the pain gets spent or dissipated, which is the Buddhist idea of self-arising, self-displaying and, and self-liberating. So the self-arising means that the painful feelings or thoughts or memories come up all by themselves. Self-displaying means that they manifest themselves, make themselves known to us all by themselves, a spontaneous process. Self-liberation, again, all by itself. When the painful emotional content has shown itself, then it self-liberates, it goes away all by itself, it doesn't hang around forever and ever and ever, which is what, what we're afraid it will do, which is what our logical mind warns us, don't take the risk of feeling that because you might get stuck in it. So if we were, again, if we were to listen to the thinking mind, that would put us wrong, that would send us down the wrong path entirely. Actually, it's not interfering, it's not doing something that helps, it's non-doing. Non-doing doesn't mean going, becoming blank or dead. It means not being too afraid to notice what's actually going on. 